We started spending a bunch of time just kind of whiteboarding out how is this going to work, arguing about, you know, the details of what would and wouldn't make sense and, you know, how could we collect enough data and all that kind of stuff. What's it going on the roof of the uh, parking garage and flying drones and stuff like that. And then he left me and he reached out one day and said, hey, I've got this idea. I'm going to be back in town. This was like January of 2020. So right before COVID hit, I've got this idea I want to show it to you. We met at a coffee shop, the kind of the very earliest uh, prototypes of gone through dozens of prototypes on his own, but this was a model of, of what he wanted to build and the idea kind of struck me as a no-brainer. And I'm working at Magic Leap, which has these yeah. augmented reality yeah. glasses, and I load up the model of, of this thing I want to build, which I have not built at full scale, but you just blow it up to full yeah. scale, and I throw it in the middle of the coffee shop, and I go, Dylan, put this headset on. This is his first time in a Magic Leap headset because no one had seen it much before then. And in the middle of this coffee shop, you could still see the coffee shop around you, but then... Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Ben and Dylan from Tubular Networks. Ben has an extensive career as a product management and product leader at companies like National Instruments, VRBO, Magic Leap, and most recently the co-founder and COO of Tubular Networks. Dylan is an engineering leader and has been at various companies like Expedia, HomeAway, and MapMyFitness. And you're now the co-founder and CTO of Tubular Networks. Welcome to the show, guys. One thing I wanted to ask you was, how did you guys first meet and decide to start the company together? And the reason I want to know, want to ask is, co-founder conflict is one of the biggest reasons for failures of a startup. And so choosing a co-founder is one of the most important and pivotal decisions someone has to make before starting a company. So let's just talk through that and how did that dynamic happen between you guys? I like Dylan's version of the story. <laughs> well, it's actually it's actually two different stories. So I'll start with how we met. Um, so we both were working for HomeAway slash Verbo slash Expedia and somewhere in the acquisition process there. Um, <clears throat> and I was I was uh, heading up our uh, experimentation platform team. So essentially at these big uh, web application companies, you do a lot of changes and in order to understand what has a positive impact on your business, you do these A-B tests, yeah. right? Um, and so we built kind of the platform. Uh, we were we were sort of the source of truth to make sure that real science was happening and it wasn't just, uh, you know, product managers and, and analysts cherry picking the best results yeah. and saying, hey, my, our feature's great. Uh, ben had a really challenging experiment that he wanted to run on a product that he was um, sort of bringing into this world kind of its own little startup within within the company. And so we started spending a bunch of time just kind of whiteboarding out, you know, how is this going to work, uh, arguing about, you know, the details of what would and wouldn't make sense and, you know, how could we collect enough data and all that kind of stuff. What's a clean and, test? Yeah, what's a clean <laughs> test versus, you know, where would we be kind of muddying the waters? Uh, and then, you know, uh, going on the the roof of the uh of the parking garage and flying drones and stuff like that and just kind of hanging out and, and got to be buddies and uh then he he left me he went on to do something else <laughs> and uh you know we, we had stayed in touch and and, and chatted now and then and, and he reached out one day and said hey i've got uh this idea i'm gonna be back in town this was like january of 2020 so right before COVID hit i've got this idea i want to show it to you we met at a coffee shop was the kind of the very earliest uh, prototypes of, of well, I shouldn't say earliest. Ben had been at it for about nine months, I think, at that point. Gone through dozens of prototypes on his own, but this was a, a model of, of what he wanted to build and the idea. Um, and it just kind of struck me as a no-brainer. Uh, and so I, at first it was just like, hey, I've got some engineering questions. Can you help me out? I said, sure. Over the next six months. Um, You're forgetting the best part of the story. I Okay. You tell the best part of the story because I have a different perspective on the best part of the story, but go ahead. So this is at Houndstooth in the domain, Rafa yeah, Rock Rose. Yeah, yeah. And I'm working at Magic Leap, which has these augmented yeah, reality yeah. glasses. And I load up the model of, of this thing I want to build, which I have not built at full scale, but you just blow it up to full yeah, scale. Yeah. And I throw it in the middle of the coffee shop and I go, Dylan, put this headset on. This is his first time in a Magic Leap headset because no one had seen it much before then. 
and in the middle of this coffee shop, you can still see the coffee shop around you, but then there is this giant tube with robotic shuttles, one hanging from the ceiling and one on the floor. And I'm sitting there explaining it, and he's sitting there looking at it, and we're both looking like crazy people, and all these folks are drinking their coffees going, what are they seeing? These guys are nuts. Yeah, so my, my perspective on that part of the story is, like, I didn't feel like a crazy person because from my perspective, I was staring <laughs> at this giant model and it made perfect sense. It Honestly, you it were immersed in the model. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't until later. I think like one of the first times we told the story where Ben was like, oh, we looked like crazy people. I was like, oh, I never even thought about that fact. <laughs> like that didn't even hit me. Like it just seemed so natural. And, and uh, you know, good job, I guess, to Magic Leap for creating that immersive experience. But but yeah, so it was uh, it was about six months later. Um, the Ben asked me to join as co-founder and, and, you know, if I'd be willing to kind of set out and try to make this a real thing. And I guess it was about 18 months after that, that we quit our full-time jobs and did it for real. Yeah. We had to get validation that we knew the technology was amazing. We knew there was a long-term future, but we had to get validation. There was a, a, a path nice. forward. So we got a first customer of which we can't specify who that is, but we can kind of talk about that experience of yeah. getting the first customer. And it was once we got the first customer and they said, okay, uh, we're ready. We know where we want you to put the tube, install the tube. We started building the, the prototypes bigger and bigger until it's full scale. And then when we raised uh, our first round, we were like, oh, we better quit our day jobs. <laughs> like this is getting pretty serious. Yeah. So it was while fundraising our first um, round, we, we quit our, our so tech time. day jobs. Yeah. So pursue this. quickly taking a step back, can we quickly describe for the audience what Tubular Network does and what you're trying to build out? What's the mission statement and where you currently guys are at? Gotcha. So uh, put simply, Tubular Network is robotic delivery inside tubes, sometimes underground. So the idea is to build a city scale infrastructure in which you order something. Five minutes later, it shows up. So these robotic shuttles. They are driven by AI, they talk to each other, uh, they're autonomous throughout the system, and uh, they can climb vertically, which I think is probably the most rad feature because now you're not thinking two-dimensionally anymore. You're able to go from underground to ground level to the 30th floor of an apartment building, and they can handle anything with a flat bottom. So boxes, totes, a laptop, a phone, we've, we've kind of delivered it all. Uh, some pretty big aerospace parts, it's it's been pretty wild what we've been able to deliver but anyway that's what tubular network is the vision is that citywide delivery network to make things 10 times faster 10 times cheaper zero carbon emissions and the mission is to decarbonize the transportation of goods got it and so quickly taking a step back you mentioned you had to validate the idea before you guys went full-time right how do you sell a vision, a prototype, an idea without even having built any of this. Because, like, I come from a SaaS background. It's very easy to prototype SaaS and be like, hey, look, here this works, right? What you guys are talking about are, is, in at least in my understanding, very difficult to, like, make a test model and be like, hey, look, this works, right? So how do you guys go about validating your idea and selling this vision to someone before even diving into building it out you got to do something similar to software like SaaS companies you got to figure out a way to to show it before you build it and big shout out to dylan uh one time i handed him a, a vr headset i think it was a MetaQuest 2 i said you ever made a vr app and he said no i said okay on top of everything you're doing like make this vr experience because we want to put it on people's heads and show them what this looks like and uh that a, a video outtake of that is what we showed to the first customer that got them bought in and said, yeah, that's what I want to do. Got it. Um, and then later we hired someone even better at visuals than, than Dylan to make a VR experience. A, a that group wasn't hard. <laughs> <laughs> called a rack and tour animation. So they're phenomenal at telling visual stories. Got it. So specifically for any hardware companies, finding a, a, an animation group, a visualization group, super handy in order to sell what doesn't exist yet. I'll also say it took maybe talking to 100 or 150 potential customers. That that journey of getting to that point where we actually found someone that <clears throat> had the right problem and said yes, um, 
it took work. It took, yeah. I mean, a good chunk of that time before we quit our day jobs, a lot of what we were doing, you know, other than putting the tech together and trying to get something that actually looked like what we claimed was, was talking to people. It's just, you know, <clears throat> every, every conversation you can find uh, and then asking that person for two introductions and just going just, I mean, it's, li it's like the modern day equivalent of going door to door, right? You're just knocking on every door you can find and ask a question. I mean, we started out talking to people in agriculture, uh, mining, mining, mining. Like we, yeah, we ended up all, uh, now we're back to talking to people about mining, but, yep. um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just, you know, we, we conceptually knew that we wanted to move stuff and we knew that there were a lot of places in the human ecosystem that stuff moved, but finding the right first, I mean, we didn't settle on kind of focusing on the manufacturing market until, I don't know, maybe like a year and a half ago. I mean, we had, yeah. we had our customer was in the manufacturing space. We didn't know if that, we, we actually kind of thought e-commerce would be the first place because there's so much stuff that moves in e-commerce, but um, we found this kind of niche in, in manufacturing that's been a good toehold for us to start exploring. How do you not get lost in this sea of options? So um, I'm guessing most of your potential s calls are with B2B prospects, right? But like you said, there's endless opportunity. How are you splitting your time between having sales calls, talking to the right person, understanding what is of value, going deeper, asking for intros versus saying, hey, this is not the right space, but also balancing, hey, I still got to, you know, make progress on the prototype, the product, whatever you're working on. And I think at this point, you guys still have nine to five jobs, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, before we quit our full time jobs, um, I don't know that there was a formula. I yeah. think it, it was. I can tell you we weren't good at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we're terrible. I, I think, you know, I think a lot of it was um, just like aggressively going after everything that came at you and probably working ourselves harder than we should have, you know, for our own health. Uh, you know, I think s since we've sort of quit our full-time jobs and, and made this into a, I'll put real in quotation marks, but you know, a real, yeah. a real business, that problem hasn't gone away. Makes sense. In fact, in a lot of ways, I would say that that question is one of the fundamental pieces of, what makes being a startup founder really hard. It's like every day you show up and you have to decide what's the most important thing today. And maybe not every day, but a lot of days, that's like an existential decision 100%. for the company. Yeah. 100%. And so uh, you are doing these sales calls, you land your first customer. Is it an LOI? Is it like a signed agreement? Is it a check? In what capacity did you guys sign your first customer? <laughs> so in the first seven minutes of our first call with this customer, which time check, I think is less than we've been talking. Yeah. They said, we know where we want to pilot this. How soon can you build the tube? And mind you, at that point, we had a, a little prototype that was about the size of an iPhone and a VR concept. So it, it took us, I think, a year and a half, two years to actually build it there. Um, and they stuck with us that whole time. That whole time, this same location, that's where we're moving aerospace parts today. It's wild. It's really cool. Um, but it took us, golly, must have been a year to get a letter of intent. It, this is a particularly large aerospace company. And so getting anything signed, even if it is a legally non-binding yeah. letter of intent, took forever. So much red lines. And so many red yeah. lines. And we eventually got the LOI, um, and then the, I think while we had started construction, got a purchase order. Like it was, yeah. You no, know, it kicked the purchase order kicked off yeah, construction. Yeah, the, the purchase order, yeah. <clears throat> but it was yeah. close. Yeah. <laughs> and the LO, just I'm not a legal aficionado, but an LOI is not an intent to hey, I'm gonna buy whatever product you're selling, right? It, an LOI is more. It's not a. It's not a contractually binding. Yeah. 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 It's more like, hey, I'm interested. Um, this means that I'm most likely gonna go through with yeah. this, but yeah, it's still a, a chance that I back out, right? Exactly. It's a document that says, if this product ex existed at this price, we would probably buy it. Makes sense. But that was enough signal for you guys to take the plunge, go raise, and start, you know, mapping out that path to building. Yeah. Yeah. I. I think. 
the letter of intent really was for a little bit of confidence as us as a business to go build it, but primarily for fundraising. Like the investors want to see they've at least signed a piece of paper, even if it is contractually worthless. Yeah. They've signed a piece of paper that says they're committed at, you know, this much setup fee and this much revenue. So um, I, I think based on our relationship with that customer, we probably would have built it without an LOI. But yeah, potentially. But uh, the LOI does does help. And as a as a business, it helps us to start to think, OK, what does a contract look like? What are terms? Who gets what? What are the yeah. benefits? What are the uh, anybody starting a company, especially in hardware, I would uh, recommend do a letter of intent, start to figure out what those terms, what your business model looks like. Get a customer to sign that because it won't happen the first time. You'll learn a lot in terms of what they can and cannot do that are surprising. And so um, it's by the time you really need a good contract that your whole company depends on, you've been through it a few times. It's kind of like uh, my advice for dating. You don't want the date that really matters to be your first date ever. Makes <laughs> Makes sense. And I'm assuming with hardware like contracts, there's a lot of other formalities. Like there's going to be build costs, operational costs. There's going to be labor costs outside of whatever monthly model you guys are on i don't know how tubular is structured in terms of business model and then there's going to be maintenance of, yeah. versus on the SaaS side it's a monthly subscription or an annual subscription or a per user like there's not a lot of yeah variables there sure but i'm assuming on the hardware software side there's a lot that you guys had to figure out on that front and still are yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's always kind of an evolving thing i think yeah i mean the other thing about coming into uh, the industrial space is that you know there's there's in SaaS you know a lot of your sales are are B two B but you can do a lot of lead generation by just having like a landing page where someone gets yeah. like signs yeah. up for the freemium service and you know gets into your software and uses it right for us we have to go in and pitch this thing to to companies a solution that to a problem that they have, but they've probably not really thought a lot about because they've just accepted it. Like, oh, this yeah. problem just exists. Like, there's no way around it. So we have to be like, no, there's a better way to do it. And then, <clears throat> you know, they're like, cool. We'd love to talk to you. Here's our legal team. And so <laughs> figuring out how to navigate all that and not be totally drowned just in, like, paying legal fees to get to the point where we could even get to signing a contract has been an interesting yeah. experience and definitely a, a learning one, like, Hardware's, they, th I know it's cliche. People say hardware's hard, but it is hard. There's a lot of elements to it that I hadn't thought of going into. I was um, at a bigger company, and we were signing a deal with an IDP. They wanted to get into the door, so they were. It was a small deal, thirty, forty k, the one that my team was signing. But our legal team drew it out to eleven, twelve months, oh. and the other side came back saying we've lost money on this because our legal fees are now more than the actual contract value. Yes. But they wanted to get in the door because once you sign that MSA with the company, now any team within the company right. can now use that software. Yep. So they're trying to play the bigger picture, which I understand. But the fact that as a company who is always in that, I don't know what the right uh, analogy is, but you're the one who wants the deal probably more than the other side. You're always going to be slightly strong armed in yep. situations you don't want to be. Yeah. That's, uh, I would say that's probably particularly in bi business, business, any business to business startup. That's probably one of the toughest lines to walk is, you know, you, you may, you may initially get interest from bigger companies that seem like, a really great opportunity and this is this is a we're living this today so yeah. this is not hypothetical um and you know those big companies they're always looking for opportunities and so they're willing to talk to you and they've got a lot of people and they've got a lot of you know people can they can take a year in legal and no one really cares there's not someone watching the money burn right yeah <clears throat> and uh as the startup yeah knowing when to kind of 
cut ties and say, look, this is not for us right now. We need to go focus on selling 10 small contracts, even if they are never going to total what this could maybe total in order to have that baseline, that that bottom of the foundation, you know, built up and a bunch of customers that you can kind of lose one here and there and it doesn't really matter and everything. Yeah, it's it's a hard it's hard to walk away from those bigger customers in the early days, but I think it's important to like, you know, keep them warm, keep the conversation going, but not put all your eggs in one or two baskets. It's also, I think, very essential for founders to understand, hey, where is my time best utilized, right? Yeah. When you're early on, you don't have a 40 person legal team, you know? fighting 17 contracts and redlining every contract with every person. But it, it, I think it's very hard for founders to say no to like a six, seven figure contract versus, hey, let me go do like, you know, two, three high five figure contracts that are probably going to sign within the next two, three weeks. Yeah, that's more actionable revenue. But it's sort of the light at the end of the tunnel where it's like, but maybe they'll do it. Right. right? We, we'd, we'd be made, right? Yeah. We just land that one contract and we'd be made. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. I think it takes a lot of maturity also to like know what to say no to, know what to say yes to. Cause again, when you're early on and you haven't raised like a $50 million round and you're not rolling around in like VC money, you got to make a lot of like very sound resourcing decisions, money decisions, allocation decisions. Like every small decision has, an impact down the line yeah. right so it goes back to the beginning of this conversation right like that's just every day you're yeah. waking up and you're making that those decisions what's the most important thing to focus on today yeah. um and you know what i mean we have a small team so as the leaders of the company and, and that team we kind of you know we, we give people the opportunity to, to step up and, and, and uh, you know, execute and bring ideas and everything. But a lot of times they're looking to us to make that decision for the whole company. Yeah. And so you're not just, it's not just one person you're making that decision for, yeah. right? You're kind of aligning everyone to a set of goals and yeah. getting them to execute on those goals. And uh, yeah, it's, you, you gotta, you gotta have a lot of conviction 100%. and, and kind of say it with, uh, with, uh, you know, eyes wide open that it may be wrong but you're gonna you know everyone's got to walk in that same direction row in that same direction uh it's it's tough i'd say it's it's one of the things that is uh contributes most at least personally for me to kind of the the weight and the burnout and everything is just that that like every decision is seemingly uh kind of do or die makes sense quick tangent i thought of whatever i had prepared here Didn't we go since <laughs> since you guys went full time, what's one highlight of the journey so far that sticks with you? Till oh. day that you would be like, hey, that was like a really high point, or that's something that you just remember. There there have been a number of them, but the one that sticks out most to me was when we were so we signed this LOI right, and we get this this contract effectively to go and and deliver uh this system this pilot system uh at that point the longest system we had ever built was a horseshoe that was about 40 30 feet long but no no it was like 40 feet long 45 feet long um this system is 450 feet long and it used uh, a novel like system for holding the tube up in the air it had to interface with two different buildings like go through the wall of the buildings and uh we hired a contractor a uh, construction company to come out and and help us put it together and build it but no one had ever built a system like this with the materials that we were doing it in the way that we were doing it so everyone was kind of figuring it out on the fly and there were so many times through that process where i was just like this is just not going to work like i i just don't know how we're going to finish this but the day that we finally punched holes through the wall and connected the tube to the building, and it was like structurally done. We had two buildings connected by this big ass tube. <laughs> that day really stands out to me. Like that was the first time. I mean, like I knew kind of academically that we would finish it and we'd get there, but emotionally, that was like the first time that I was really 
it really dawned on me that we were really doing this. Like we were really going to have these robots moving parts for this company and pretty soon. Nice. Yeah. Any high point that stands out for you? Oh, I've got so many. <laughs> uh, so I'll give you an anti high point. Yeah. Uh, which people would expect to be a high point, but wasn't. And then a couple of, of e- examples of that. So, um, Sometimes in startup world, you see people in the news or you see people up on stage getting awards and you think, wow, that's got to be the highlight. And we recently won a couple of awards from Austin Regional Manufacturing Association, which is this phenomenal community of manufacturers around here. And that was a precious, awesome moment. But what kicks that in the butt every time is like when you point your bat metaphorically and say i'm gonna hit it out there and then somehow it connects and and gets there um that's the highlight for every entrepreneur somebody who's yeah. building something new yeah. and different 100 and so like very similar to his my highlight was that first delivery that went through that system so not just the tube but like the thing that we're actually doing is delivering and i remember we put a box over here uh, and we ran over to the other side and somebody sent it and it showed up on the other side and it wasn't mangled. It just like, it just calmly showed up Nice. and it was like, Whoa, this is going to work. I think this is, this is totally nuts. And then, um, the other highlight was when the team did a super outstanding job. So you always try to hire the best and the price people you trust with the yeah. company people you'd want to get a beer with like there's a lot that goes into to choosing the team especially when we don't have a lot of uh cash for headcount like every person it feels like is an existential hire um and recently uh we welcomed our second kid my wife and i our second kid into Congrats. the world yeah. thank you he's uh seven weeks old yesterday um and i stepped out for paternity leave And uh, it wasn't the the three or six months I would have had at a tech job. It was about five or six weeks. And um, I I looked at Dylan and I said, I want to take a paternity leave to really be a good dad and a good husband. And I think that the company is not going to crash and burn. I think you guys are going to do a good job. And uh, I stepped away and I was able to like put down my phone and not check on I. No pings, no. No pings. Like I didn't lose. uh, (laughs) Not. (laughs) <laughs> Correct. A few pings. Um, I feel like it's also hard for an entrepreneur to completely shut off. Like, even if you have muted everything, you're going to go check every once in a while to, like, make You can't everything. stop thinking about it. 100%. But when you can trust your team to handle it for a while, and then they do in a really big, awesome way, uh, it, it opened up my mind of, like, oh, okay, this company has reached a new level. I can chill out on trying to be, be like doing everything, obviously not doing everything, but, uh, I can work differently now. Makes sense. And, um, that is really nice. So like weird advice for startup people, uh, or founders is like, take some time off, see how the team does without you. It might crash and burn. It might, be better than if you were there because and either way you learn a lot during that and just your ability to step away helps you not get burned out and gain a lot of perspective 100 percent. it also tells you where you need to invest time correct if if something crash and burns without you that means there's something fundamentally wrong in your operation structure but i think like you said it highlights a lot for the person sweet How has it been for you guys coming from traditional tech world? I know you had a mixed AR, Magic Leap background, so slight for into AI, um, hardware, but building a hardware software startup, I feel like it's a very different path than building a SaaS company or just a traditional software company. How do you guys challenge what you don't know? Because there's probably a lot that you don't know about building the sort of hardware software mix you mentioned construction you mentioned needing a contractor how do you plan you 3d model the two but okay you know nothing about punching a hole in a building right so yeah. how do you how do you go about that what are the skills you need how do you 
figure that out? Is it hiring the right people? Is it you guys upskilling? What does that process and journey look like? All of the above. <laughs> um, I would say one of the skills <clears throat> that's super important to have in your team, and it doesn't actually necessarily need to be a founder, but it, you need to have at least one, maybe two people in your team who can, uh, <clears throat> who are comfortable learning enough to figure out how to do something. And be, you, you have to be comfortable not knowing everything, but making decisions anyways, and sort of plotting a course half blind, but having enough confidence in being able to sort of pick it up as you go along that you can get to the other end. Um, and this is, I'm going to sound full of myself. This is my superpower. Like, I don't, like, I'm a decent leader. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, like, maybe like a B plus engineer, but I can B plus engineering on just about anything. Makes sense. If I have enough time to just like sit down and, and focus on it and learn it. Um, so like, you know, going into tubular, I had done a lot of just sort of on the side, like messing around with 3d printing and, uh, you know, 3d modeling and, you know, a little bit of mechanical engineering, done a fair bit of, uh, the electrical engineering, but I by no means ever built something as complex as the robots that we have today. Uh, and I haven't done it all on my own, right? We, we hired, uh, a great team that, that brought a lot of expertise out from a lot of different places, mecha mechanical engineering, robotics, software. Um, but in those early days, being able to just say like, yeah, n no one's ever like figured out how to make this tube withstand 80 mile per hour winds. So how do you do that, right? Just go figure it out. You start calling people, you do some math, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, it's it's if as much as you can hire for your weaknesses. Yeah. But you just have to be comfortable just kind of winging it a little bit and you know, I my approach is always to try to do something myself and then try to find someone who can check my work basically. And if that person's conclusion is similar. It's similar, right? Within 20% plus or minus of what I came up with, I go, "All right, I think we're in the right ballpark. Let's keep going." Makes sense. Uh, from my perspective, the, the name of the game when it comes to building something new out of hardware is uh, trying to reduce the cost of learning. And uh, it's a very specific definition of that, so don't, don't go too crazy. Uh, specifically, like when we wanted to do a new mechanism, we could have gone and invented a new mechanism out of raw parts and built it ourselves and it would have taken months and who Trial knows. And error. Yeah, and we would have gotten it wrong. Or we use like drawer slides from Lowe's as a sub part of the system. And uh, that worked shockingly well for a number of months. And we thought those things were gonna fail after a few days and then they just kept working. And when we have a, a new geometry that we need to do we 3d printed out of plastic even though we know it's going to end up being metal because of how all the all the strains on it uh, let's just try plastic and we print that thing out in a matter of hours and then it lasts a lot longer or breaks in a different way than we were anticipating and we learn faster that way so using off-the-shelf stuff um not reinventing anything that we don't have to yeah and then um really the even though parts sound expensive, the largest cost of any startup is time. 100%. So if you can get something off the shelf uh, or like abuse the way that something was designed to, to see if it works for yours, uh, you learn faster and then you can go design and invent the right thing. Yeah, yeah great, great example is- Still wrong, but closer to right. <laughs> great example of that is still today, in our production system, we buy these cheap little bearings from Amazon that are pillow block bearings that are inside of a housing, and we just rip them out of the housing because it's like they haven't been the failure. They've never been the thing that failed. And so we can get them for like 90 cents a piece from Amazon. So why stop? Yep. Makes sense. 
first battery was a, a used battery off of a, like a scooter that you rent downtown because it was like $40 and did a pretty damn good job. And then we learned enough from that to realize what we needed out of a real battery. And so we went and designed that. And I'd say probably still redesign it many more times. Oh, yeah, for sure. There's a word in Hindi called jugard. Jugard? W- yeah, which basically means like it's a big thing in India where you just figure shit out. So you'll see these um, cycle cart vendors selling fruit off their cycle cart, but they'll take an old scooter's motor, just attach it to the cycle and add the accelerator. And now they have a motorized cycle cart for like one hundredth the price right. of buying a motorized cycle cart or a motorcycle. And that whole idea of, oh, hey, I don't need to go the proper route. I can just like put two and two together. It does the same thing that I was going to do anyway for much less. And it's a much better solution. And that's Mm. a big thing you see in India. But like it's not as widely seen of a trait here in the U.S. of like, like if it's broken, you generally go buy the next thing. There's no like. Oh, hey, let me tape it together and find a way to fix this. Right? Yeah. In rural communities, I'd say there's more of that. Like, <laughs> I, I definitely came from a place where scrappiness was was highly valued. But uh, that's really cool. Jugard. Yeah. That's neat. Yeah. Um, but no, like, I, I, I tell a lot of friends that the whole idea of just get like putting something together for the sake of doing it as raw as possible yeah. to validate I think um, takes like there's also a little bit of an entrepreneur gets a little scared of like, is this the right thing for me to do? But again, it's part of the journey. That's not the final solution. Like you guys said, it's it's OK to go down this path because it gets you to the end goal faster or it helps you fail faster, which I think is a better use of resources than absolutely. Let me go down this whole path and then fail at the end versus okay, didn't work, I got to pivot and find another solution. Yeah, when, when Ben said learn fast, I mean, the other side of that coin is fail fast, right? Yeah. 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 And, and Love failure. Yeah, it's really important to, you know, develop that thick skin against failure. But it's also important to recognize that I think a lot of times people take the fail fast thing and they kind of corrupt it a little bit into like, it's okay to cut corners and it's okay to like make sloppy decisions and stuff like that. What I tell my team is fail fast doesn't mean the goal is to fail. It means that the goal is to learn. And sometimes, oftentimes the quickest way to learn is to fail. So as long, I don't care if we have failures, we can have as many failures as we need to, as long as each one of those failures, we're learning something new and then we're, we're changing the parameters the next time through so that we're not just learning the same mistake or not making the same mistake over and over again and learning the same thing. I I think the notion of also failing fast in today's world has become very, there's so many tools to like spin up a landing page, run a couple ads, look at your click through rate. And like, if it's below 2%, okay, you don't have the right idea. But I think like you're saying fail fast doesn't mean find the best landing page and conversion it means what is the right way to validate that this is something someone wants or not yeah find that the fastest you can it doesn't mean do it the quick and dirty way um but no i understand um i 100 percent agree with what you're saying that it's there should be a learning out of every yeah. experiment every a b test like you're saying right there should be some learning hey you optimize this funnel okay they're not converting why are they not converting did you learn something out of that or yeah not? yeah exactly if you just ran a test they're not converting and now you don't know anything more you wasted both the time of the test you wasted engineering resources and now you don't even know how to make another good test because right you, you just have to anything. throw another dart in the dark yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. sweet how are you guys preparing for the long haul journey of building a hardware software company and I know you said you're in phase one. I know you probably have a lot of phases. Um, I don't know off the top of how many clients you have actually built out for, but this is traditionally a much longer cycle of building a company. 
and I keep referencing SaaS just because that's what I know, but um, like SaaS tech world are shorter cycles are easier to exit out of. You can find sales faster, um, like uh, acquisitions faster. My assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, is in this space, your journey is probably going to be 10, 5, 10, 15 years and a much longer journey. How are you guys prepping for that? What's the plan? How are you guys going about that? Uh, one aspect of that is that the, the company itself has a rather long view on its usefulness to society. So um, we're very much not a company that's looking to get built up in two years, have an exit, and yeah. go live on an island or whatever. <laughs> whatever the people in those news articles end up doing with that money. Uh, this is to improve the human condition by making deliveries way better faster and decarbonized uh, decentralized and so when you have a mission that's that big and and impactful it helps you hire the right people and think about things plan the right way to, to be in it for a longer period of time and uh, if if done correctly this will be my last job that I will have for decades because I mean last company I don't know if I need to be CEO that whole time but like this company is going to build enough important things that I would like to just play in that space for the rest of my career. Makes sense. And that helps me make decisions and plan for longer. That's probably too philosophical. Dylan, no, give a more I, practical answer. I, no, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think it's reflected in our mission, right? If our mission was, you know, optimize a great mission and a mission that we both actually have passion for that we could have chosen would have been, um, you know, something along the lines of automating manufacturing to return manufacturing to the U.S. That's something that we both have passion for. It's, yep. it's a, it is a goal that we participate in, um, but it's not the mission, right? The mission is to decarbonize the transportation of goods. Right now we're building this system. We hope that there's a phase two and a phase three where we get to the point where we have this as a, as a new form of infrastructure that's citywide. Um, but there might be a problem beyond that where it's the biggest you know challenge in decarbonizing the transportation of goods we could be still trying to accomplish that same mission 20 years from now probably not us right and that's the other piece of this which is that like i think you have to you have to be realistic as a founder it really is anyone participating in an early stage company about what the long term picture is okay. and so for us i mean we talked about this even before we ever hired anyone or raised any money which was i hope that i'm not cto sometime in hopefully like the next few years not because i don't think i could do the job or whatever like i hope i could grow into that but realistically i just won't be the right person to do that job for the company at that point in time and so you know setting everything up and trying to as much as you can take the ego out of it and say, we're trying to accomplish this goal. How do we set the company up best to accomplish that goal? Not how do I set myself up? How do I see the most success or whatever? Yeah. Makes sense. Quick tangent. You guys said, you mentioned decarbonizing a couple of times. How do you guys make decisions on your day to day? Because, and this is probably not the best analogy, but like, Tesla's been um, given shit before of like, oh, hey, you're trying to do EV, but our you know, electricity comes from carbon um, carbon emitting sources of... Yeah, dirty grid, yeah. man. But like similar to this, if your goal is to decarbonize the logistics supply chain, are you guys constantly ensuring that that's part of your build process and process as well? Or is that down the line? Or do you not look at that right now? Or because I'm assuming that probably hinders a lot of your supply chain and your build process and your timeline on things. If you're also worried about making sure your supply chain is an as carbon neutral or zero carbon supply chain. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Everything we buy, you know, half of the vehicles that our team drives. Like, 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 if you really wanted to go through and add up the carbon footprint of, of building the product that we build today, it has one for sure. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it's it's something that we we think about. We're so early right now that we, you know, going back to earlier, right? We have to kind of pick and choose the right battles. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is something that we keep an eye on. But I think the the other thing is that like nothing operates in a vacuum. Hundred percent. Right. And so we might incur some carbon cost to getting the company to the point where it's scalable and we can deploy. Um, you know, we use a, a high density polypropylene tube. It's plastic. It's a it's a hydrocarbon based you know product that um, you know comes from processing oils. Um, and but if you look at kind of the the broader landscape of the cost that we incur as a society to move stuff around makes sense that's a much bigger contributor Perfect. to carbon footprint of everyone in everyone's lives than some of the products that we're choosing to use and, and leverage um there's also the people that we choose to partner with you know right now we're talking to a company that's in the um the trans power transmission business the utility company in the power transmission business and their big hook is connecting clean you know solar farms wind farms clean energy production to you know long distances to urban areas and so by partnering with people like that we open up new avenues to say actually you know we leverage the power that they make available to charge our robots and you know that lowers the overall carbon footprint etc so we're definitely aware of it and cognizant of it um we have to make realistic trade-offs today yeah. but you know as long as we keep track of it and you know don't let the company go don't let the company lose sight of that goal right uh i think net benefit over the long yeah, term will sense. be positive to bring it back specifically to the the Tesla criticism uh, is we, we built out the model and if we go off renewable energy, we reduce carbon emissions by 100%. But if we pull from a coal uh, sourced grid, then we reduce carbon emissions by 96%. So either way, moving the needle very much in the right way, 100%, 100%. similar to, to EVs, if you look at the math as it nets out, EVs are still a step in the right direction. 100%. But um, you have to make the trade-offs of like, are you not going to install anywhere that doesn't have electricity from renewable sources? And it's like a lot of those sites that we're looking at don't have that yet. And uh, so we, we have to make that trade-off. Yeah. But understanding the whole system, like Dylan said, and knowingly making those trade-offs yeah. as you work your way towards that goal is the important part. And I think it's also a long tail effect, right? Like, um, as every piece of it starts thinking about decarbonization and sustainability and everything, over time, it'll get to that point. I think it's very difficult for everyone to be like, hey, I'm only gonna operate in like a carbon neutral environment, because then nothing's ever gonna become carbon neutral. Right. If everyone operates with that same arrangement of, well, hey, I'm not gonna work here if you like use carbon-based fuels or whatever right um but no i think it's a step in the right direction i was just curious from a point of view of does it make your job harder in making decisions for supply chain and logistics and building stuff out and how you go do your operations but again with the longer vision i don't think it does yeah and and actually ben was uh at a um earth day related conference last week earth x so earth. rad yeah and he he shared something with us maybe it was with me i don't remember who he shared it with specifically but that i that i think is really uh you know apropos to this conversation which is that he was saying you know this experience changed how i think about working with oil companies traditionally we've just said basically don't want to deal with you guys like we don't want to be a part of that but fundamentally our product lowers carbon emissions and so if an energy company an oil company comes to us and says we have an application where we can replace a truck that uses diesel with your product 
why wouldn't we help them become like have less of a, you know it's like we shouldn't cut off our nose to spite our face right like if if those opportunities come now if they were like you know i don't know i'm t having a hard time coming up with like a really bad example you know if they were like well we're going to use it to like move dead babies or something right like then that maybe that's a scenario that we would say uh maybe we don't want to do it but you know it's like fundamentally having an eye on that long game and saying yeah there may you may make decisions that at first glance in isolation seem like they're driven by something other than the mission but yeah. ultimately you keep that mission in mind you'll get there makes sense i'm calling it right now someone listening to this podcast works at a big oil company and they have an abandoned pipeline that they want to retrofit to move things with zero carbon emissions with tubular network and they're going to find out because of this just putting that out want, in the world i want half a point for her <laughs> <laughs> so, um one, one last question about co-founder dynamic how do you guys make decisions are there ever arguments are is it is it clear line of distinction between what's your territory versus what's yours or how does that dynamic work between you guys i think as much as possible we try to have like who who owns the decision and then respect the other's opinion on on anything with the company i mean it's our we co-founded it and so uh if there's any business or marketing uh or otherwise decision that i'm making you know he's welcome to criticize it profusely uh and has saved me from making some of the the dumber mistakes so thank you um and i think within the company building a culture of respectfully challenging and disagreeing well. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to how we met and why I liked working with Dylan so much is we disagreed well. I had this idea for a test. He respectfully told me how dumb that idea was in, in certain ways, right? He didn't just say, oh, well, that's dumb. He was like, it, that way of testing, it's not gonna produce a clean test, yeah. and so your results are gonna be worthless. Uh, I would re recommend something like this. And that kind of disagreeing well is fundamental to good founder dynamics and really anyone you hire on. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think the disagree disagreeing well is, is the key. And, you know, I think in a lot of ways, you know, we, well, actually, I think statistically we are kind of your typical uh, startup founders. Like, as far as I understand, like actually being in your like mid to late thirties and having a family and stuff is more common than you see again, 100%. the 25 year old that has the hundred million dollar eggs or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, the average age of an entrepreneur is like 36 or 37. Ding yeah. ding. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm the old man here, but that's okay. Um, uh, but it, it, my, my point is that like, <clears throat> there's, there's some things that you learn when you have a family and you've just kind of been around for a few decades and stuff around like the, the battles that you choose. Um, and you know, what is like how to be humble and recognize what's your opinion versus what's important and, and stuff like that. And I think that, you know, being able to sit down and say, you know, Ben, you're working on this thing and I have my own opinions, but my opinions aren't necessarily any more valid or, or bring any more, you know, likelihood of success. So maybe I'll share them and I'll say, Hey, just my opinion here, you know, just the way that I would think about this or do this or whatever. Here's the X, Y, and Z. Take it or leave it. Um, or sometimes you just don't say anything because you're like, I don't want to muddy the waters. Uh, and being able to do that with the team. Ben has a really great way of doing this where he kind of like has stuff broken out into this sort of tier system where it's like, you know, edict, like something that has to happen. Um, you know, a strong suggestion, you know, something that he feels passionately needs to happen. Um, you know, moderate suggestion something that he maybe has some passion for but doesn't really care and then like just shit he's making up off the top of his head right and I, that's not the exact that's not he, how he lays the categories out but that's how i think about it and so he'll just kind of do this thing right where, where he'll be talking to me or the team or whatever and be like this is like you know this category thing here it is right and that's really helpful because you know in in a founder relationship but also when you're leading a team um it's it's important to sort of set that like 
this is something I really care about. And so I, I think it's important that I that you hear me and have a good reason to not take my feedback. Uh, but, you know, this other thing is something I really don't care about. I'm literally just making it up on the spot. So, like, you can totally trash it and I will have no attachment to it whatsoever. And that distinction is really important. Makes sense. I like it. Cool. I, I like to do a couple questions at the end of every interview. What is your guys's tech or startup stack? What do you guys use to run the company? Yeah, we use um, <clears throat> Ross, the robot operating system, is our primary software framework for the robots. Um, we use kind of a hodgepodge of some Python and Golang for um, our sort of intermediate tier of software that sort of the interact the systems that the robot interacts directly with um we use like elastic search and some other stuff for log aggregation um we use discord for communication we use discord internally. for communications which is like i love discord and i hate discord every day um i feel like discord is the ui is not the best for like productive it's not but I've I've heard both sides of the conversation. Yeah, it's not as structured as Slack. Yeah, it and tries to be, but it's not meant for that audience. Right, but. and and you don't own the users. Yeah, which sounds weird, yeah. but like in a corporate Slack environment, you you get to commission every single yeah, seat yeah, yeah. and every single user where you don't in Discord, which is actually one of the reasons I chose it um, over Slack was uh, it's important to me from a like a. a employee experience perspective that the connections that people make at work can outlive their life at the company so when someone leaves if they've made a connection with someone on discord they keep that connection right they don't they're not just like suddenly cut yeah. off um so yeah um i don't know that's most of our our technology we, we have like a I, I could get down into the hardware, but that gets no, that's real, no, and real. any ticket management any operationally we use trello okay. sort of we don't <laughs> use it as well as we should. We're trying to get better. And we kind of are Atlassian. Like, we have uh, nice. Confluence for the wiki. Nice. And, uh, Interesting that you have Atlassian and not Jira. Uh, Trello. Yeah, Confluence, not, not Jira, but Trello. Yeah. But yeah, honestly, um, it's it's Atlassian getting us with the freemium thing. That's what it is. Okay. They were like, hey, guess what? You have a free uh, uh, Confluence page. Yeah. And I was like, sweet. I, we need that. And. Soon they're going to come and be like, you owe us a lot of money. And I'm be like, well, I guess I'm going to pay it. Nice. <laughs> what would I, you say? Yeah, I think I, somewhat related and really good advice for, for entrepreneurs is like our advisor stack. Like we've built an incredible team of advisors who really care about what we're building, very mission aligned. But the two best advisors by probably an order of magnitude would be our spouses. Yeah. And the reason that Dylan makes HR choices Sorry if I'm. Uh, no, no, no. You're you're on track. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's like I hope I'm not going off on here. The reason he makes such great HR choices is because he's got this mentor. His wife is incredible at HR. She thinks about things in ways that blows my mind and just really like does the right thing by the right people. Uh, does she have advisor equity or? She's got spouse equity. <laughs> <laughs> and the same with my wife. Uh, she's a marketing and public relations genius. Uh, she's recently gotten into product nice. at, a, at a, a fitness tech company. And uh, it's funny because I was in product marketing, then she got into product, I got into product, she got into product, and she's better at every step uh, than me. And so I think next is startup world, and I guess that's how all retires through her but uh she's brilliant and they spend a lot of time um thinking about our company and how to make it better but also have a lot of patience with us nice i'm making some assumptions here but a lot oh, of no, patience no. with us and and giving us some of the best advice we've gotten so as an entrepreneur if you have a significant other or a spouse uh and they care about what you care about you know like listen to them they've got some of the best advice you can get it's funny you said that because my next question is going to be, what's your guys' support system? But I guess we already answered that. Oh, we've got multiple levels of that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely I think our, our families are, are number one in that list. Um, you know, I think 
I'm actually pretty bad. But like, if I didn't have my wife, I would just be like lonely man on an island. <laughs> Because I'm not particularly good at like a big beard up in the mountains. Yeah, sure. yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not good at asking for help. So it's. I'm really fortunate that I have a wife that just sort of you know understands when I need it and gives it to me. Um, but we do have you know outside of outside of family, we do have a set of mentors that have been super um, super valuable to us. Uh, yeah, I think I think finding people that are good sounding boards and knowing it's really tempting to like believe everything that everyone tells you. But then if you ask 10 people, you get 10 different 100%. perspectives. And so I think it's important to have, you know, a, a, a good and number of people, right? If you have one person that you're like, this person was successful. So I trust everything they say, and I'm just going to do everything they say, you know, you're just going to try to replicate their success, which isn't going to be successful. Also, it's you. very easy for someone to give advice. Yes. From a position of like, I have zero risk in this yeah. situation. Yes. Um, you should go do X. I'm like, but like, I can't. Yeah. But like, I 100% agree that at the end of the day, it is your decision and your opinion. And every piece of advice you get should be an input into what your end decision is, but not a, oh, you told me to do X. Let me just go do X. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you're, if you're a founder or you're starting on that journey, and you have those like one or two trusted people, that's great, keep them. But go find 10 others who are willing to have a 30 minute phone call with you once or twice a month, where you can just bring them a half dozen questions, shoot them in an email before the meeting and say, this is the stuff I'd love your feedback on. And then just aggregate all that feedback. Okay. You know, like I, I do this with uh, other founders and, and we have a, a monthly 30 or 60 minute meeting and and, uh, often there are appointed topics that we're trying to discuss, but it also also devolves into like, listen to this crazy stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's fundraising or this this supplier just or this employee or whatever. And it's just like the ability to level with somebody who's been through that journey or is going through that journey. One of the uh, richest grounds for advice that I've found. Yeah, uh, the. I had, uh, this is the third or fourth time I've done a startup, by far the farthest I've ever made it. Um, and I always had this perspective, like before this time around, uh, that like all of the like, oh, it's so hard and, you know, hemming and hawing and stuff that you hear about founding a, a company was sort of you know, bullshit, like just buck up, you know, you're doing, you're getting to follow your dream or whatever. This is the first time where I've, I've lived it in a way that's like talking to other people who have been through that particular hell, uh, <laughs> is super valuable because there's just not a lot of people in the world that have that specific context. 100%, 100%. Um, you know, I imagine it's, while I wouldn't say that these two groups are equal, I, I imagine in a lot of ways it's like the sort of uh, camaraderie that, you know, maybe soldiers go through, N not likening being a startup founder to the, the hell that soldiers go through, but like that, that like when you collectively as clip a that and like, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only quote that makes yeah, yeah, out that, of this. That's, that's, a, that's a seven second clip. Um, no, but, but when you, when you, go through when you have a, a group of people that have all kind of gone through a similar type of trauma um and you know in the military one of the terms that's used is trauma bonding right you you have a unique perspective and a unique ability to to empathize with what what other people who are going through that kind of thing sweet i do this segment where i ask every guest a last question for a future guest so your guys's question and i'm going to ask you guys to give me one each but your guys' question is, what is it that makes you fundamentally human? Oh. And it can't be what you do. Like, yeah. it can't be your job and, like, your God, I hope that wouldn't be what would make you fundamentally human. <laughs> I mean, okay. There's a cop-out answer, which is, like, you know, my son and my family, right? <laughs> I don't say it's a cop-out issue or cop-out answer because, like, it's not true, but... It kind of feels like a cop-out answer because, you know, it's like the obvious as a, as a dad, you know, of course I'm going to say my son. 
Um, but maybe there's like a more generic answer, which is like how we connect with the people that we love. Um, and I think it's important context for start for founders, right? It's like, it's really easy to just let everything else in your life go and just pour yourself into a business. And it feels like the right thing to do, mm -hmm. right? It, it feels like what's necessary, but like, I don't, I think that that gives you a distorted perspective on the world, which doesn't benefit your business. And I think that, you know, I don't know that it's worth it. Like, I don't know that killing yourself, even if you do have that unicorn exit one day, I don't know that it's worth killing yourself to get there. 100%. So I would say, yeah, just like how you connect with the people that you love. Damn, that's good. Uh, I'm going to go with to change and to grow is what fundamentally makes me or humans human. I've got a seven week old and a two and a half year old and watching them change so fast and grow so fast. It's, it's like seeing a microcosm of what I'm going through as a entrepreneur, you know, is somebody who you think after, I don't know, a decade in his, into his career, maybe more than a decade. Oh, wow. Don't need to think about that. Uh, you know, I, I've, found yep. my ways I've, well more I've, than a decade bro yeah okay <laughs> well more than a, almost two decades into my career that, that i'm, I'm kind of stuck in my ways but i'm learning and changing quickly and uh -huh. growing and a lot of it looks just as hard as it does for for the little ones that are in my household and then when you think about humanity on a broad scale uh what we're asking them to do is put new tubes in the ground to totally change how things move and uh it's a lot of that same journey how what needs to be better and how can we do it and then making that that journey is as painful and glorious as it is how to make that journey so i think that's what makes us human i like that what's your guys's question for my future guests so i've been israel sort of primed us on this he was like you always ask for a question. I've been thinking about it, and I haven't. I don't know that I've come up with a good question. Um, something that I've been struggling with lately, and I maybe have sort of alluded to it a couple times, is the like the burnout piece, right? So I'm gonna like, I think out. I I think through talking out loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I apologize, that's but fine, fine. <clears throat> I think that it's it's something, you know, something along the lines of like how do you keep a passion project, which I think is what most, why most founders get into what they get into. How do you keep a startup being a passion as opposed to it becoming a noose around your neck? Uh, how do you find that balance? Nice. That is a very good question. Let me go with that one. <laughs> you only get one. That's yeah. work. That works. That works. <clears throat> Sweet. Thanks for coming on, guys. That's all the questions I had for you. Yeah, thanks for having Where us. Where can listeners find you? What do you want to plug? And we'll link everything in show notes and everything. But So uh, our website is tubular.network. So .network is the domain, like .com. It's .network. So that's easy, tubular.network. And then uh, we're pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, come down to Austin. Let us know you're coming. You can come check out the, the robots. We're with the ACC Highland right now. Um, and so that's why at the beginning of, of this session, uh, I realized it was in person and I was able to, to get over here because, yeah. you know, right. we're around yeah, here. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. Look us up online. Yeah. Find us on LinkedIn. Yeah. Sweet. But well, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate the time. We'll link everything. Try to get some cool graphics from you to insert throughout the video. But. Thanks for coming on, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.